99% of developers don't get OIDC. Many can't even begin to explain the differences between OIDC and SAML. Every single time you hit sign in with Google, you are using OIDC under the hood. And understanding how OIDC builds an identity layer on top of OAuth and JSON Web Tokens is the bare bones expectations in 2025 for every competent entry level engineer. But the engineers who get ahead in this market, they understand the low level architecture that makes OIDC special. If you don't know these concepts, then you should consider watching this video, where I'm going to break down how OpenID Connect works, its architecture, and some of its nifty details around single sign on and discovery endpoints. This is the knowledge that will make you a better engineer. Let's get started. Now, the best way to learn a new computer science concept is to start with a concrete definition. Both SAML and OIDC were designed to solve a specific challenge, how to allow a user to log into one application using credentials managed by another. This idea is called federated identity. Instead of every application maintaining its own usernames and passwords, one trusted identity provider or IDP handles authentication and other applications called service providers or relying parties trust the identity provider's assertions. The user gets the benefit of single sign-on or SSO, log in with one set of credentials and access many different services, while organizations gain security and centralized control. While they solve the same core problem, SAML and OIDC come from different eras and technological foundations. SAML was designed in the early 2000s for enterprise web environments, while OIDC emerged in the 2010s for modern API-driven mobile-first systems. As a result, their formats, transport mechanisms, and extensibility differ significantly. Let's talk about the nature of each standard. SAML, or Security Assertion Markup Language, is an XML-based framework. It describes how identity and security information, called assertions, can be exchanged between a trusted identity provider and a service provider. It was built in an era dominated by SOAP, XML, and browser redirects, which is why it relies on verbose XML documents and HTTP POST bindings. Its design emphasizes interoperability between large enterprise-scale systems and strong guarantees of authenticity and integrity via digital signatures embedded in XML. SOAP, or Simple Object Access Protocol, is a protocol that uses XML to structure requests and responses, wrapping all data inside an envelope, a special XML container that defines headers or metadata and the message body. OpenID Connect, or OIDC, on the other hand, is a JSON and REST-based protocol standardized by the OpenID Foundation. REST, which largely replaced SOAP, is a simpler stateless architectural style that uses standard HTTP methods, GET, POST, PUT, DELETE, and lightweight JSON instead of XML. It's faster, easier to integrate, and more web-friendly. SOAP structure is just too verbose and complicated, and it requires more overhead and makes it way harder to develop and maintain compared to the simpler, human-readable nature of REST. OpenID Connect is actually a thin identity layer built on top of OAuth 2.0. The TLDR is that OAuth 2.0 provides authorization. This app may access these resources, and OIDC adds authentication. This user is who they say they are. It uses JSON Web Tokens, or JWTs, for representing identity claims, making it lightweight, web-native, and easy to integrate with modern stacks like JavaScript, single-page applications, mobile apps, and APIs. But let's dive a little bit deeper. So OAuth 2.0 by itself is an authorization framework, not an authentication protocol. It's designed so that a user can grant a third-party application limited access to their data without exposing credentials. For example, letting a photo printing app read your Google Photos. The app receives an access token that allows it to call an API on the user's behalf. However, OAuth does not actually verify who the user is. The token only proves that someone granted permission. It carries no inherent identity information. This is fine for pure API access scenarios, like backend integrations or service-to-service -service communication, but it's insufficient when a client app needs to authenticate a user for login purposes. So OpenID Connect is an authentication protocol built on top of OAuth 2. It enables authentication of end users against an authorization server, which verifies the user's identity and issues an ID token, usually a JSON web token. This ID token contains information about the user in the form of claims. These claims are just verified information about the authenticated user, such as a unique ID, email, or name. As a superset of OAuth 2, OIDC comes with all of OAuth 2's authorization capabilities and then adds authentication. OIDC defines a user info endpoint that clients can query for additional profile data, as well as a discovery mechanism that lets apps automatically find an identity provider's endpoints and configuration. Together, these features turn OAuth's authorization flows into full-fledged single sign-on login flows. Like SAML, OIDC is widely used for single sign-on, where a user can use their credentials from one trusted identity provider to access multiple applications or services. 
While OAuth 2.0 can certainly operate without OIDC, that's only appropriate when a user identity isn't needed. For example, when a backend service just needs permission to access an API. But when you need to actually know who the user is and establish a secure session tied to that identity, OpenID Connect is the necessary extension that turns OAuth's authorization into reliable authentication. In both SAML and OIDC, there are three main parties involved. The first is the user or principal. It's the person trying to access a resource. Second, there's the service provider in SAML or the relying party in OIDC. This is the application the user is trying to access. And third is the identity provider. This is the trusted authority that authenticates the user and issues an assertion in SAML or a token in OIDC. The service provider or relying party trusts the identity provider because they have exchanged metadata. For example, certificates, endpoints, and keys ahead of time. The trust relationship is crucial. The identity provider signs the assertion or token so that the service provider or relying party can verify it was not forged or altered. Although SAML and OIDC share the same broad flow, the details differ significantly. Now let's talk about the data flow. In OpenID Connect, the user is redirected to the identity provider's authorization endpoint. After authentication and consent, the identity provider sends back an authorization code as per the OAuth 2.0 flow. The application then exchanges this code for tokens an access token used to call APIs, and an ID token which contains the user's identity. The ID token is a JSON web token, a compact JSON object signed by the identity provider. The application verifies its signature and claims, such as issuer, audience, subject, and expiration, before authenticating the user. In OpenID Connect, there's a discovery endpoint, usually at well-known slash OpenID configuration. It's a metadata URL that lets clients automatically find all the important endpoints and configuration details of an identity provider, like the authorization, token, user info, and JWKS endpoints without hard coding them. It's how clients discover how to connect and authenticate with an OIDC provider dynamically. And before we dive deeper into how OIDC works under the hood, this is the perfect place to thank the sponsor of today's video, Clerk. One of the trickiest parts of working with JSON web tokens is balancing all the trade-offs. If you put them in cookies, you risk cross-site request forgery unless you configure things perfectly. If you put them in local storage, you're wide open to cross-site scripting. And if you try to roll your own refresh token flow, you're suddenly managing token rotation, revocation lists, and session lifetimes manually. Clerk solves all of this by giving you a batteries-included authentication and user management platform that's designed for modern apps. At a high level, Clerk handles the full life cycle of identity, secure signup, and sign-in flows, passwordless login, multi-factor authentication, and session management. Under the hood, it takes care of the messy details of token issuance, rotation, and verification, so you don't have to worry about expiring tokens, replay attacks, or keeping your refresh logic perfectly secure. And because Clerk provides SDKs for both front-end and back-end, you can enforce auth checks consistently across your entire stack without writing custom middleware everywhere. One of the nicest parts is that Clerk isn't just an auth API bolted onto your app. It gives you drop-in UI components, like pre-built sign-in and sign-up forms, as well as low-level primitives if you want to customize everything yourself. That means you can ship quickly while still having the flexibility to go deep when needed. And because Clerk is designed for scaling apps, you don't have to worry about re-architecting your auth system once your project grows beyond a prototype. So if you're tired of being your own security engineer, or you just want to avoid the common JWT pitfalls we've been talking about, definitely check out Clerk. I'll drop a link in the pinned comment and the description down below. Okay, so sure. OIDC is built on top of OAuth 2.0, and the basic flows are pretty well known. There's a couple advanced specifications and patterns that solve specific security and usability challenges that I want to touch on. The first is enhancing authorization request security, specifically JAR and PAR. The standard authorization request passes all parameters like client ID, scope, and redirect URI in the browser's URL, the front channel. This has two main problems. The first is leakage. Sensitive data can be leaked through the browser history, proxy logs, and the referrer headers. And the second is tampering. A malicious actor could intercept and modify the parameters, for example, change the requested scope. So that's why pushed authorization requests, or PAR, was introduced. It's defined in RFC 9126. PAR solves these problems by moving the authorization request from the front channel to the back channel. Here's how it works. The client application first makes a direct secure back channel post request to a new pushed authorization request or PAR endpoint on the authorization server. This request contains all the authorization parameters. The server then validates the parameters, stores them, and returns a request URI, a short-lived reference, and its expiry time. The client then sends the user's browser to the slash authorize endpoint with only the client ID and the new request URI. With this, no sensitive parameters are ever in the browser's URL. It also avoids errors from overly long URLs, so it's very practical. 
And JAR is really just another way to solve the same problem. JAR stands for JWT Secured Authorization Request, or RFC 9101. Instead of pushing the parameters, it bundles them into a signed and or encrypted JSON Web Token. Here's how it works. The client app creates a JSON Web Token that contains all the authorization parameters like scope, redirect URI, etc. as claims. This JWT is signed, which becomes a JWS or JSON Web Signature, which is effectively a way to secure a JWT's claims with a digital signature or message authentication code or MAC. This proves its integrity and authenticity. You can optionally encrypt the JSON Web token to make it a JWE or JSON Web Encryption as well, and this will help hide its contents. The client then sends this JWT to the slash authorize endpoint as a single request parameter. So the server can then verify the signature to ensure that the parameters haven't been tampered with and that they came from the correct client. If encrypted, the parameters are completely opaque to the browser and any intermediaries. Note that par and jar can actually be used together. A client can push a jar to the par endpoint, providing the absolute highest level of security and integrity for the request. The most visible technical difference between SAML and OIDC lies in the token format. SAML assertions are XML documents. A typical assertion might look something like this. They are very verbose, difficult to parse manually, and require XML canonicalization rules for signature verification, making them cumbersome in lightweight applications. OIDC ID tokens are JSON web tokens, simple Base64 encoded JSON objects. A typical one might look something like this. Because JSON web tokens are compact, easy to parse, and supported by many different libraries, they're ideal for mobile, single-page applications, and API contexts. Now let's move on to the transport mechanisms and APIs. SAML was built before REST became dominant. It primarily uses browser redirects and form posts to move XML assertions between providers. This makes it ideal for browser-based SSO, but ill-suited for backend to backend or mobile use. Its reliance on XML digital signatures and certificate metadata adds complexity but ensures strong enterprise-grade trust guarantees. OIDC is instead built on OAuth 2.0 and relies on HTTPS APIs and JSON responses. Communication between the relying party and the identity provider happens over well-defined endpoints. For example, slash authorize, slash token, and slash user info and tokens are passed via standard HTTP headers. This REST-based design makes it a natural fit for modern microservices, mobile apps, and cloud architectures. Now discussing a bit on the ecosystem and use cases. SAML is a very well-established protocol, so it's suitable for integrating with older, legacy enterprise systems that use SSO. It's widely supported by corporate identity providers such as Okta, Azure AD, Ping Identity, etc. It's commonly used for linking SaaS platforms such as Salesforce, Workday, and Slack to internal directories like Active Directory. Its main strength is that it provides robust, well-understood security in controlled enterprise environments. OpenID Connect, on the other hand, powers the modern web and consumer identity ecosystem. It's what you're using whenever you sign in with Google, log in with GitHub, or use Auth0, AWS Cognito, or Clerk in your app. It's lightweight, API-driven, and designed for both web and mobile clients. Because it is built on OAuth 2.0, it also supports fine-grained authorization via access tokens, which SAML does not natively handle. And so now we might have a better understanding of why OIDC is replacing SAML. OIDC represents the natural evolution of federated identity. Its use of REST, JSON, and JSON Web Tokens aligns with the technologies developers already use. It integrates naturally with APIs and microservices, supports incremental consent and token exchange, and reduces implementation complexity. SAML, while mature and secure, is increasingly seen as cumbersome. XML is verbose, digital signature verification is complex, and it doesn't work well outside browser-based contexts. However, SAML does remain deeply entrenched in large organizations, where it's trusted, audited, and already integrated with hundreds of legacy applications. That's why most identity providers today support both SAML and OIDC, enabling interoperability between old as well as new systems. Over time, as enterprises migrate towards cloud-native systems and mobile-first applications, OIDC is expected to become the dominant standard. If you want to learn how to build Docker, Redis, and compilers from scratch, I highly recommend that you check out CodeCrafters down below. It's hands down the best project-based learning platform. And if you want to experience the best authentication as a service and user management platform, check out Clerk down below.